Tape 1, Friday, 7 p.m., Bill Stafford, Conference 224. Praise the Lord. That almost makes me want to sing. <laughs> Not bad enough to do it, though. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Oh, the singing tonight, super, super, fantastic singing. All the way through, I felt the touch of God on every song. At least, maybe I need it. But I'm glad I do. If you stay in need, you meet God. If you arrive, you're dead as a hammer. Amen. So I must be in awful need tonight because every song has got right to my heart. Made me meet Jesus. And I'm here to meet him in a fresh dimension. I'm not happy, satisfied with all I've moved into yet. He's so much more than I ever imagined. Every time I move into a new dimension, I see what all I've been missing. And I get sick of myself. He becomes more and more. I become less and less. Oh, what a Savior. What a Lord. What a God. What a Master. And what a hope of revival tonight. That if we meet Him in a fresh way, in a new way, we'll never be the same again. Lord God, I want to tell you, I just believe we're going to meet Him. I, at least I am. And you can do what you want to do. I can't help you. All I can do is preach, but I can't enforce it. You can do what you want to about it. I, I, I used to try to enforce it. A few times now I'd like to. <laughs> Amen. But every time I do, I get in trouble. So I'm just going to preach it and let the Holy Ghost do his work. And um, Brother Jimmy, what a joy to be here. A lot of memories. A lot of things go through my mind as I think about what God's done in this place. And for me to have a part of it is more than I can understand. For me to be preaching here tonight is more than I imagine. I'm just glad God let me be in on what Mildale has done down through the years. And to me, it uh, doesn't hurt me any to be identified with this place, and that hurts me with the liberals. But they never did like me anyhow, so I ain't never been hurt a whole lot. And uh, I just want to thank God for the balance that this, this place has held down through the years. Staying balanced, not, over, not going over in deep, deep truth to where you're just sitting there fat and sassy and doing nothing for God. And yet not off on the extreme where people get when they don't stay balanced in the Word of God. And I've watched this place stay right balanced. As far as I'm concerned, you say, how do you know? Because I know. And I'm right. Amen. <laughs> but I praise the Lord for the balance of Mildale, old-time way, and yet right balanced in the Word of God. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. At least, at least you can shout here a little bit and praise God. That's just about a lost art anymore. I'm, I'm just glad to hear somebody get loose and wave a hand, you know what? In most places, they're sort of afraid of any kind of excitement, except uh, in their emotions, and I just choose to praise God anyhow. In Luke 22, if you'll open your Bibles tonight, in verse 31, and I want to talk tonight on the process of maturity. In Luke 22, in verse 31, and I want to remind you when I start preaching on this message, that God has devised a plan for every person in this building to bring us to the fullness of Jesus in this earth. Not that we arrive, but to keep bringing us on into such a relationship to where relationship with Him is what really matters. And that's all that matters. Keeping that relationship with Jesus. And if you keep building that relationship and keeping that relationship, an abiding relationship, I think everything is going to be fine. But in Luke 22, the Lord Jesus, and I, I was just following the other weekend, I was in uh, First Baptist Church, Pergosa Springs, ministering with Miss Bertha Smith. She'll be 98 years old in November. 98. I, and I sat there amazed that uh, when she would minister, and uh, a lot of people have a problem with her preaching, but since she's not an ordained preacher, but spent 40 years on the mission field, I figured I got something I can hear from that lady that might help me. Amen. Amen. I don't believe in women preachers. I do not. I don't believe God's ever anointed, I mean, has ever ordained, had us to ordain a woman to preach. Amen. 
But I believe there's a ministry that we need and from ladies of that caliber, my Lord. And so I never shall forget when she was preaching and ministering. I hardly know how to say that. But uh, her mind wonders and she gets off track. But here's what amazed me. Her relationship with the Lord is such that when she's off track, God's on her. And Lord God, most preachers now can be on track and God's not within 50 miles. Amen? I mean, here's a woman. Here's a woman who all of her life has just pursued God. Holiness. Godliness. Righteousness. Staying right with God. Walking with Jesus. Preaching holiness. And yet, now then at her old age, he, God still protects her. Still protects her. That even when she wonders, even then, you sit there amazed at the glory of God. Now folks, that is, and I'm going to tell you, to me, that's a blessing. If I live long enough and preach long enough, I'm going to get to the point to where probably, I mean, I wonder now, and I'm not but 53. Lord God knows I'll be off track most of the time when I'm 98. Amen. But I want to be and so walk with God that even off track, that anointing of God will be there to where the sincerity and the godliness and the glory of God will so be on me that even off track, the hand of God will still be there. Now, boy, isn't that glorious? Hallelujah. All right. Psalm in Luke 22. Psalm. See there? Already off track. Luke 22 and verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You know, that, uh, that verse always amazed me. I thought he was already converted. But look, sound like he needs to be converted again. Sounds to me like a walk with God's continual conversion. And uh, notice Peter's answer in verse 33. This fascinates me. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. In other words, you just don't know how spiritual I am. I mean, I've, I've got, I've got uh, vacation Bible school certificates. I've got uh, gold seals from my train union courses. And I've got badges to machines on faithfulness in Sunday school. Lord, you just don't know how spiritual I am. I mean, Lord, I'm ready. I mean, I don't care what the rest of them do. This old boy is spiritual. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou, that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I don't know of anything in the Word of God that really blesses me anymore, and I say this because it's so sweet to my own heart, that blesses me any more than the faithfulness of God. And you see, what, 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 what's so glorious about this, God is saying on Simon Peter until he can get him to Pentecost. Because his ultimate aim was not to get him saved. His ultimate aim is to bring him to the fulfillment of all God had purposed in his life when he first saved him. And God's going to do that no matter what. And I'm of a firm belief. I'm of a firm belief that every believer, every believer, the great designer has designed for your life a purpose that will fulfill the glory of God in your life. And I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. You'll never be thrilled and happy until you find what God's got for you and pursue that to the end for the glory of God. Now, I've never seen a time in my life when we're listening to any more truth and living any less in the glory. We've got more book reviews. We've got more Gothard seminars. We've got more books on how to stay married. We've got more books on how to be filled with the Spirit. We've got more books than you've ever read. We're in the most informed society that's ever been. And yet, the most discouraged, the most upset, the most hurt, the most uh, bewildered, I mean, got more going for us than any nation, anytime, anywhere, and the greatest opportunity for Holy Ghost revival, and I spend half of my time trying to get preachers out of the mully grubs. Amen? I mean, and if, 
and I won't even tell them what I'm going through. It'd make them feel so bad. I mean, they might commit suicide if they knew it's going to get worse. I mean, what are we looking for, folks? A, a perfume squirted journey? A rose petal journey? Did God promise you to fly to heavens on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Sure, I know we got a lot of preaching on it's all going to be easy. Joy Boy TV, nicey, nicey, wonderful. But ladies and gentlemen, the wonder about it all is that God is faithful in the middle of it all to bring me to the ultimate purpose of God for my life. Amen. Amen. And brother, it's not what I do, it's what God's going to do, whether I like it or not. And, I, and the reason why I know a lot of people are probably not saved is because there's no evidence of the work of God bringing them to the purpose of God. They're right where they've been for 30 years, sitting on Jordan's stormy banks, casting wishful lies. All they can talk about is how bad it is. They never walk in any glory. They never burdened over souls. They never want to be in an all-night prayer meeting. They never want to change. You say, Brother Bill, what do you think our problem is? Well, in the process here, the first thing I want you to see is the problem with Simon. Jesus referred to him as Simon, which is his carnal name. When he gets ready to use him on the anointing of God, his name is Peter. But when he refers to him... In his attitude now, he calls him Simon. Well, why is that? He's full of pride. Well, how do you know? He said, well, Lord, I don't care what you say. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know as much about me as you think you do. I mean, after all, I just got through going through a seminar on how to walk with God. I mean, after all, Lord, just remember, I am Simon. And I love you more than anything in the world. And I'm ready to do more than you said. I've got news for you. You, you just don't know. In fact, I know more about me than you know about me, Jesus. And is that not the point where pride begins? When we're confronted with the Word of God and we know there's something wrong in our lives, what do we do? We'll say, well, that's all right. Nothing wrong with that. It's part of me. I got it from my daddy. It's part of my personality. But ladies and gentlemen, God will never bring you to the glory of what He wants to do in your life till He can deal with everything in your life that's not originated by holy God. And that means everything that comes from self. I never shall forget. I was raised among a lot of jealous people. I was raised in a family around jealous people. I never shall forget going to family reunions and sisters and brothers getting fusses because one daughter had a new dress and uh, others couldn't afford one. I, I mean, just jealousy. We never had a family reunion when I was growing up. But what it didn't end in a brawl. Cussing each other. And in my little ears, I was just a kid. I'd hear all that stuff. And then those lousy scoundrels, they could sing like a mockingbird. And they'd get up on Sunday night after raising the devil all Sunday afternoon and get up in church on Sunday night and sing like crazy. And all I saw was, is this Christianity? Is this of God? And I grew up thinking that the Christian life was, raise hell if you want to, but put on a good front in church. And you need not sit down and look at me like that, bless God. Some of you have done it. Amen? Look at me like you don't like it. Hey, I, it upsets me so bad, I probably won't sleep over ten hours tonight. Amen? Listen, I've never seen a time when people are trying to preserve their opinions and preserve their life and preserve their spiritual pride. And they're so afraid to say, I repented, I got right with God, I had to face up to it. We're living in a generation of proud people. I've got an ego as big as this room. I want to excel. It's in me as big as a mountain. I've got pride as big as anybody. But I want to tell you, I thank God that every time I get up just a little bit, He's got some devil out there to level me. 
And if you hadn't been there lately, hang on, buddy. There's one around the corner. And if you're going to be used of God, He'll level you too. Right? Well, I then I was raised in Cloud Springs Baptist Church, and every conference was a was a fight between the Proctors and the Brown. They'd bring family relationships into church. I'd sit on the front seat with my daddy. Had to. He made me. Man, I ought to be spiritual. I sat close enough to the fire, I ought to got burned or something. But, Lord, my daddy put me around the front seat. While all the other kids were passing notes, my daddy wouldn't even let me nod. I mean, if I nodded, he'd hold my head up, set up for a boy, I'll tend to you when I get you home. Lord, I thought it was a sin just to go to sleep in church. Now, since I've been preaching the deacon so much, I still believe it is. Amen. Man, I never shall forget those conferences when they'd get up and have a family brawl. I mean, in church, in church, in church. I was right. Hey, it's a wonder I'm not an infidel. And that same crew, they'd all gather in the choir on Sunday morning, and the little choir leader would get up, and they'd start singing, oh, What a friend we have in Jesus. And they'd go to squalling, and last Wednesday they raised devil. Raised devil on Wednesday night and sang like a you say, Brother Bill, what are you what are you getting at? Ladies and gentlemen, we've got some people sitting on these seats tonight that don't even know what it means to deal with flesh, to deal with self, to deal with their old rotten lifestyle of sufficiency that's not depending on God, and we'll never have revival till we get away from self sufficiency into God sufficiency. Peter, I can't use you like you are. I can't put you on Pentecost like you are. I can't give you spiritual power like you are. But I will when I get you ready. And Peter said, I'm ready. Jesus said, we'll see. I was pastoring in Lepton Drive and I thought, well, I, I didn't know I was jealous. At least I tried to act like I wasn't. And I hadn't been there long, and we just had a blowout, and they tried to run me off. And then after the, a preacher heard about it, Barney Cunningham ran Cunningham Bookstore right downtown Chattanooga. When he heard we was having all that trouble, he come up and started a church in a little old building, just a little piece from Lupton Drive, just right down the street, a little white block building. And you know what? I could stand on the front of my church and watch them disgruntled church members go to his church. And a lot of them would drive by and just grin at me to let me know they just wanted, wanted me to see them go to see how I was going to react. I said, bless God. <laughs> Boy, I want you to know, jealousy surfaced in me as big as a mountain. I did not realize it was so wicked. Well, I, I was hoping, bless God, burn that building down, Lord. Do something to show them I'm of God. <laughs> Lord, you just, I was here first. <laughs> Bless God, he ain't got no right in my territory. Lord, hit him with pneumonia. Do something. Let him know I'm the cock of the rooster right here. I'm ready to go with you all the way, Lord. He ain't. He's in on my territory. Well, that went on for a while until... The church kept getting deader and deader and it got worse and worse. And finally one day God finally hemmed me up over a situation. And God said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, son. If I can't get you straightened out over your own jealousy, I'm going to let him grow and I'm going to make a great church out of him. And I'm going to let you sit here and rot. And I got scared. For the first time I saw jealousy like a cancer. I saw what it was doing to me. It wasn't bothering Barney. In fact, he's just having the fun with my members. <laughs> Taking them in. <laughs> They're starting another work. I mean, folks right in, almost in front of me. And man, I was wading through hell by the acre just trying to hang on to what I had. I only stayed on the 51.5% majority when they tried to vote me out. That's not a very good voting majority. Most preachers won't go for less than 75%. Man, Lord God made me stay on 51 and a half. 
You say, why didn't you leave? God wouldn't let me. I'd have run in a minute. What would you have done for a living? No more than they were paying me. I wouldn't have missed a blooming thing. I mean, I, I could have made it without it. So it's one good thing about not ever making too much. You can just move any time because you don't have to adjust a whole lot. Amen? Your lifestyle is lower as it's ever going to be. And ladies and gentlemen, when I saw what God was saying to me, I want you to know even though I was a saved man and called to preach, I had to deal with a carnal, ungodly self-sin called jealousy. And God said, in fact, I'll just tell you the truth. I put him here so he could help you. Because what he's going to do to make it surface is going to be the biggest favor of your life. Because when you get right with God, I'm going to bless both of you. But I'm going to bless you a little extra. And brother, when I heard God and saw what was going on in my heart, I crawled in my study and got on my face before God. Old hardwood floor, we couldn't afford any carpet. And I, bowed, I got on the, the hardwood, that old, that old study right in the front of that church. And I, I cried out to God and I said, God, I'm sick of this. There's got to be more than the ministry in this. I don't have to be the best. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be nothing but what you want me to be. And Lord, I'm sorry. And before God, I'm sorry. All I ask you is don't take your hand off of me. <laughs> and on that old hard, hardwood floor in the front of that church, God made me face up to jealousy. Jealousy. Where'd it come from? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You see, we've got a lot of people trying to cast out the demon of jealousy. Well, mine didn't come from the devil. I inherited it from my parents. <clears throat> see, a lot of y'all would love to go to one of these deliverance services and get everything delivered out of you. I got news for you, the devil didn't originate it. Self originated it. You would have had it if the devil hadn't been around. See how quiet it gets? You know what? Not me, bless God. Not Yeah, you. <laughs> Don't run right here and say, well, and we got people going down the aisle, won't be delivered. Won't, won't be delivered, the demon of gossip. Devil ain't got nothing to do with your gossiping. You had that for the devil ever. You didn't even know there's a devil when you had a long tongue, long as this aisle. I mean, you could carpet it with it. Amen? And the devil, you say, Brother Bill, I just breathe the devil. No, that's flesh. Flesh! Pure flesh! Squeak, bless God. That'll be all right. You'll never get deliverance from as long as you blame it on something besides its source. As long as you're running down here wanting somebody... Well, brother, who, who wouldn't like to get completely delivered from everything? But God's not going to do that. Why? That's what drives us to brokenness, to repentance. That's what drives us to usefulness. It's never us. It's Him. It's not what I can do. And by the way, let me just inject something else. I'm just sick and tired of us thinking that we've got something to offer people. You hadn't got a blooming thing to offer people, and neither have I except what God's doing in your life that He originates. Man, we call in these pro football players, and we call in these pro basketball players, and we, we, we hire them to work with the youth for a week because they got a youth ministry. They ain't got a blooming thing unless God's working in their life. All they'll do is try to make them depend on self-sufficiency instead of God's sufficiency. Amen. Amen. I was in First Baptist, uh, First Baptist Pagosa Springs. Son, you've been there, and uh, just just the other weekend. And this old boy belongs there now. He was with the Phoenix Suns in basketball. He's six foot ten. He is a knocker. And that old boy got so saved. It's pitiful. But in that meeting, God wiped him out, and he gave a testimony that just knocked my socks off. And I said, Lord, that's what I've been trying to say all the time. You know? Do you know the sin he confessed? He said, I thought because I was a pro basketball player and had somewhat of a reputation as a good athlete, I could lead these young people. 
But he said, I want to get on the altar tonight and tell these young people I'm sorry because my relationship to basketball don't do a blooming thing for my spiritual walk with God. And you know what he said? He said, for the first time in my life I've seen that God's not interested in basketball. <laughs> Neither is he interested in my basketball ability. And tonight I want to renounce my ability and I want to get in on what God's doing in my life. And he just cried out to God and set that place in the Holy Ghost revival. What's wrong with it? Oh, Brother Bill, well, we're going to come in and do our thing tomorrow night. Well, you do your thing, and it won't be worth a rip. Because God ain't interested in you doing your thing. I didn't think you'd like that too well on the first night. I'm sick of it. Everybody's coming in doing, you know, just performance, just trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, for God's sakes, God's not interested in us doing nothing. He's interested in what God can do through me. And if God's not doing it, it'll be the same old results. Simon, 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 Simon. It'll all be Simon ministry. You'll never get ready for the glory and the power and the Pentecost. You'll never get to the fullness of what God wants you to be until we deal with a Simon in us. The problem is Simon. Secondly, the proposal of Satan. Simon, Jesus said to him, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. And I'm going to let him. You say he didn't say that. He let him. Why didn't he stop him? I don't guess God figured that Simon could get where he warned him without it. So I guess Jesus is actually the one that lets Satan have him because Jesus could have stopped him if he'd have wanted to. So I guess when you nail it down, Jesus originated it. I mean, he told him, hey, Satan wants to put you in the sieve and he's going to sift you. I mean, he's going to wear you round and round and round and he's going to try to make chaff out of you. And tr you see, what he really said was this, Satan desires to have you. He wants you back. And the word there means he wants all of you under his control, back where you used to be. And he said, I am going to let him have you long enough to put you in the sieve. But don't you worry, while you're in the sifter, I'll be praying. Hallelujah. Now, folks, I don't know how we're going to walk with God apart from the devil being allowed at intervals to put us in the sifter. I mean, you say, well, I don't like that. Well, if it results in a Pentecost, if it propels you into a worldwide ministry, what do you care? See how quiet it's getting? Why? Because we're living in an easy time. Tell me something good, preacher. Tell me how to build a good self-image. I need some of this Robert Schuller stuff. Give me some of that Dale Carnegie stuff. I mean, we. I want to get my self-confidence. I want to pull myself up by my bootstrap. Tell me how I can build self-esteem. I'll tell you how. The Lord God can bring you to nothing. The greater He'll stand you in self-esteem, because it'll be self-sufficiency in God's sufficiency. Amen. You say you're putting us down. Well, isn't that the way God said it? Whosoever shall what abase himself shall what? I didn't think you knew it, but I thought I'd tell you anyhow. The way up is where? What kind of down? The kind of down that God brings in my life. When He allows Satan to put me in the shifter and puts me in a situation that I can't understand. And yet in the middle, while the devil is whirling me round and round and round, I can remember He may throw me around, but He can't throw me out. Hallelujah! I am secure. I am safe. And it may not be a fun time, but you wait till it's over. <laughs> I mean, when God had Mildell in the sifter. 
I remember when God had this ministry in the sifter. The memories that go through my mind at the time we thought it was ruined. God just laying a broader foundation to let it explode. And it wouldn't be where it is now if we hadn't just remembered that Satan can only drive us closer to the everlasting sufficiency of Almighty God. Let him push. Let him put the pressure on. Let him raise Cain. Let him threaten. Let him bluff. Just wait, devil. One of these days you'll see me standing 20 foot tall and you'd have wished you'd have left me alone because you're driving me to God's sufficiency. Hallelujah. I can tell by looking at some of y'all now, you ain't had a spiritual, <laughs> you ain't had a spiritual drip in 30 years. You know what you've come here for? For somebody to bless you. You're looking for something outside of Jesus. You're looking for something in your environment. If I can just find something to help me. Lord, I'm having a tough time. Tell me about it. <laughs> and it's not going to get any easier. If you come here to look, you say, well, Brother Bill, I thought it would know. Half of these folks are psyched out, living in a psyched out mental attitude that has no involvement whatsoever in satanic warfare. As long as you, bring, as long as you blame your gossip and jealousy on the devil, you'll never get to the source of it. Because it didn't come from the devil. If you want to find out where it come from, read Galatians 5, 17 through 22. The works of the flesh, not the works of the devil. The works of the flesh are these. And he enumerates 17 or 22 of them. I forget. Maybe I forget the number. Read them. He didn't say they came from the devil. He said they're the flesh. Amen. Amen. I can't have every time I get on this, I can't have a thing about Ruby Kelly at Lupton Drive. Bill, my son Bill, who's with me tonight, uh, remembers Ruby and... Uh, Wickedest woman, longest tongue, she can sit in the living room and lick a skillet in the kitchen. <laughs> Bill, my line, I, listen, she had a she had a tongue. She listen, she could eat oatmeal through a gas pipe and never and lick the bowl clean. Amen. Listen, I don't care what I preach. The next Sunday I'd hear all week long up at Wool Woolworth where she worked. She just blasted me with church members. Gossiping. She never had nothing good to say. You're talking about speaking in tongues. She was a master at it. <laughs> I said, Lord, if that woman ever comes down the aisle, I'm, I'm, you've got something you want me to say to her, and I hope you'll let me say it. The glory of God fell. We had a mourner's bench in Lupton Drive. Sonny, you've been there too. We got a bench out there about 14 foot long. And whenever she, one Sunday morning, the glory fell. Oh, about 15 got saved. Heaven came down. I didn't preach. That's always a good time. Amen. And boy, the people shouting, praising God, singing, hollering, hallelujah. And I mean, everything was in order. God was moving. And about that time, I looked up and here come Ruby down the aisle. I said, praise God, this is revival. I said, Lord, help her to be serious. She come and fell around my neck, laid her head on my shoulder and said, Brother Bill, I've got an awful tongue. It is so bad. I said, mm-hmm, tell me about it. I said, I started to say, do you want me to tell you about it? She said, what do you think I ought to do? I said, Ruby, there's the altar. It's 14 foot long. Lay it on the altar and if it won't stay, stack it up. But for God's sakes, don't let none of it get off. Keep it there till it gets right with God. And you hate what you are without Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know that woman turned out to be one of my best friends. Ruby Kelly became one of my best friends. You know why? I told her the truth. I wasn't a smart aleck. I told her the truth. I wept over it. I was broken over it. I asked God not to let me say it unless he could use it. You say, Brother Bill, what did she see? She controlled her tongue. She controlled her tongue. Brother, we're dealing with things the devil hadn't got anything to do with. So that's why we think we're in victory. We're not even dealing with the devil. We're dealing with the flesh. We ain't even got to the devil yet. You take a man standing around wanting deliverance from gossip or greed or deliverance from jealousy or deliverance from lust and he blames it on the devil. He's not even in the war because the devil ain't even close. The flesh has got him. 
And we got people running down the road saying the devil's done this, the devil's done that. And the devil's sitting there saying, boy, look at that. They don't even know where I am. And he's having a heyday while we're running down dead in alleys. We're not claiming any territory. We're playing fairy tales. We're playing games. We don't even know where the battle is. Amen. Devil sitting outside of a church one day on the curb, and a fellow walked by and said, The devil was crying. And he, he said, Devil, what's wrong with you? He said, They're in there blaming me with everything in the world, and I ain't been in there in my life. I've never had to bother them. Why? The flesh has got them. And I'm tired of getting blamed with their gossip and jealousy and lust and greed. And ladies and gentlemen, as long as you blame it on something outside yourself and blame it on the enemy, you don't even know where the battle is. I'm, I'm just fed up with all this stuff. A fella came to me one time and he said, Brother Bill, I want you to know God delivered the devil. Uh, I went and got prayed over. They laid hands on me and I got delivered from lust. I said, who delivered you? He said, it was a demon. I said, oh, no, uh-uh. You'd have had that whether the devil was around or not. Why do y'all get so quiet? You think I'm not tolerant? Had you rather go on playing your fairyland games and playing little mother goose and Cinderella and not know where the battle is? Or would you rather get where the battle is and quit blaming the devil and let's get out there where he is in some warfare. We're up to our neck in crocodiles and talk about draining the swamp. Bless God, let's get out to the crocodiles. Who are they? This ungodly cults. This ungodly, real demonic world where hell is raging, where we're not going on with God, where we're not living in victory, let's deal with the devil where he really is. Now, I will say this hastily. I believe you can keep an, a, a, a thing in your life long enough to where the devil can use it as an avenue to bombard the daylights out of you. But that still don't mean he caused it. You let it stay there and he took advantage of it. And anything you won't deliver up and confess and blame on him, then you'll never get... Listen, every time you go down an aisle to get delivered... What about temper? Temper's not from the devil. Temper is from just old self. My daddy had it. I got it from him. I mean, I ought not have to confess. I'm not to blame. I got it from daddy. It's a Stafford trait. Tight and temper. <laughs> when I preach on giving, do you think I like to give? Mm-mm. I'd a whole lot rather keep. All Scotch-Irish are that way. I ain't never seen a Stafford nor a Macintosh. Ever want to give anybody anything. <laughs> well, why do you do it? I've got a break with Macintoshes and Stafford. Why? They're wrong. Who's right? The Word of God. And brother, you've got to die. You've got to die to go with God. You've got to die to what you like. And you've got to die to mama and daddy's little sentimental ideas. Some of you will never serve God because you can't get above the level of your mom and daddy's spirituality. And every time somebody gets up and preaches on you, say, not mom, yeah, yours. My daddy's a great guy. My daddy's right now has just undergone 28 radium treatments. Can cancer's come back in his lungs. And we're just, we're just trying to love him to death. I want him to die knowing he's the most loved man. I want my daddy to know he didn't do everything perfect, but he's my daddy. And my, I can't ever remember my daddy ooey-gooing over me. I don't ever remember him hugging me and saying, I love you. He just sort of beat it into me. <laughs> did did, did any, any of y'all ever hear your daddy come up and say, son, you're the finest. And they put these commercials on TV of daddy hugging their sons when they're 20. Lord, my daddy, my daddy, the only time he hugged me was when he tried to get to the razor strap and keep me from running. That's the only time he ever hugged me.
And yet, you know, these little kids come up today and they've been kissed on and had money handed to them and everything's been going their way. Got a car by the time they're 16. Got money handed to them down every lane. And they run around and say, well, my daddy wasn't good to me. Oh, you little spoiled brat. I'd like to have you for about 30 minutes. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I never was... Raised, I was reared off the floor about three feet every day with a razor strap. <laughs> it hadn't hurt me. I love my daddy. I have some awful memories about things he did wrong. But they don't ever come back anymore. I can think of so many things he did right. And I'm watching him slowly fade away. I'm a spitting image of my daddy. I don't know why I could have favored my mama. My daddy and I never have won any Mr. America contest. I never have been asked to pose for the, photo, for the cameras. They told me when I was on TV I wasn't photogenic. I couldn't even spell it, so I didn't realize what they were talking about, so it didn't bother me a lot. But you know what I did learn? I learned some things my daddy never learned. My daddy never learned some things about giving. My daddy never learned some things about confessing and restitution. If I'd have stayed where dad and mom wanted me to, or if, I mean, where mom and dad stayed, and you're the same way because they didn't hear what we're hearing. See, there's no excuse for it. They didn't hear what we heard, Brother brother Warner. They didn't hear what we heard. I, I've never heard any greater preaching in my life than we're hearing right now. I mean, everywhere I go, I'm hearing of meetings and preaching like I've never heard. Amen. we got the greatest preachers in the country going right now. I, every time I say that, I, I was preaching in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was a-blowing and going. I said, Brother, some of the greatest preachers I know are living right now and they're Southern Baptists and I'm one of them. <laughs> I said, Lord God. <laughs> I didn't mean I was a great preacher. I meant I was a Southern Baptist. Amen. But anyway, boy, I, I lost the crowd. I might as well have hung it up in, buddy, because it's all over. <laughs> when Jimmy was... <laughs> When Jimmy was making announcements a while ago, I said, boy, you know, Mildell don't need anybody else to come in. they got a great preacher. Jimmy, Jimmy can preach more making announcements than most preachers can preach doing a sermon. <laughs> Amen? I mean, he gets me under conviction. I, I just hope he don't preach this week on repentance. I, I, worst guy I've ever seen to get you wanting to repent. I thought, don't you thank God for that? I hear about Sonny Holland's ministry all over this country. I hear about Manly Beasley's ministry all over this country. I hear about Ron Dunn's ministry all over this country. I want you to know, friends, television, everywhere you turn, things are happening. And there's no excuse for us not to be full of God. You say, why well, aren't we? We're so busy trying to get it all doctrinally fit. We're missing the person of Jesus. And in the middle of all that sifting, when the proposal of Satan has been thrown on me and Jesus doesn't stop it, I forget that while I'm in that sifter being thrown around, I hear the prayer of the Savior. Jesus said, Peter, while you're in there, I'm going to be interceding for you. Now, what better person could you have praying for you than Jesus? Amen. Amen. And by the way, folks, just let me inject something else. If you think you're going to get in a place where they don't have any problems, if you've got a church that you can say, boy, in fact, when I get off of an airplane and they say, Brother Bill, I don't know of anything wrong. It, our church is wonderful. Have you ever seen these fellas that were just fake? Wonderful. Majestic. Fabulous. I want to puke. You know, you just sort of want to uh, uh, regurgitate. Amen? It ain't one. <laughs> Amen? My wife is here. She'd kill me for saying that. Don't you tell her either, Bill. I get sick of the fake. Let 
Let's get down to where the battle is. Jesus may just be over there on the sideline saying, I'm praying for you. Uh, oh, but Lord, I don't want it this way. Yeah, but I, you're getting special attention because Jesus has got everything focused on you. I guess it could have, or he wouldn't have prayed that it wouldn't. In fact, you know why he knew it could fail? Because that's all he ever got when he got us. And the moment you think you can't fail, you already are a failure. And here's what he said. When you're converted... Well, Brother Bill, I thought he was already converted. Oh, but I had to find out in my own life that the Christian life is continual conversion. Every time I'm confronted with something in my life that's not of God, or that it originated in the flesh and the Word makes it surface, I have to convert. What do you mean? I have to turn away from it and deal with it as sin. And the more you walk with God, the more sensitive you get with what's wrong and the more you move into God the less you think of yourself and the more you think of him amen, amen. now listen to this listen to this I've got one of the greatest pastors a man could have Wayne Barber is God's man I'm in subjection to my pastor now if you don't believe this you can call my preacher I call him once a week just to share with him that I'm praying for him. The other week they did something that I didn't agree with. And after all, I've got seniority on him. I've been at this thing longer than he has. And he didn't consult me. You know, I've got to be a little more spiritual because I'm 10 years older. But you know what? God don't build seniority. I, I never did say anything bad about it. He just got in here. I said, bless God. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut back on my giving. Well, man, now, I could and still give 10%. I'm far beyond 10%, folks. So don't. I'm not getting into my 10%. So don't you look at me like you're going to get out of it. I mean, <laughs> Amen. I mean, I don't have to put... Listen, my wife even ties. She gives 20% on my plane tickets. I said, Sue, for crying out loud. I said, don't go nuts. That's expense money. She said, won't hurt you to give on. I said, wait a minute. She does. She just lumps it all together and gives 20% off top. That's crazy. But you know what it's done? It's taught me more and more about trusting God and giving. Well, I said, I don't like it. I don't. And I never said anything but to my kids. Brother Jimmy, Brother Sonny. All I, I, I said it in front of Bill, I know, and I know I said it in front of Steve. And they, 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 they go to our, the same church. Well, boy, you know, I, I just sort of got this. Do you ever get this gun? Now, bless God. You say, well, Brother Bill, that don't seem like much. Well, I didn't think it was. I hadn't told anybody but my family. <laughs> you know, the first Sunday I went back to my church, do you know where my, my preacher was preaching through Hebrews? And then coincidentally, he landed on Hebrews 13, 7. Obey them that have the rule over you. I mean, just incidentally, that was the verse God, you know, and I, it just had to be a coincidence. It couldn't have been God. <laughs> You know, I sat in that service with 600 people. We have two morning services, both of them packed. I sat right in the middle by where Ed Smith is sitting right now. You can't help but see Ed. He, he needs it so bad, you know. You just have to see Ed because he's under such conviction. But anyway, I sat in that about like Ed is, and I've been over just like he is. I really, and I, and I didn't mean Ed's under conviction. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But Bill, Billy's doing this, so undoubtedly. But anyway. 
I said to mind my own business, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost of God sat down on that preacher, and it was as if I was the only person in the building. And you know what God showed me? If I can't live under authority, God will take away my anointing. And you know what else I saw? What if you cause your kids to lose confidence in your preacher? Then he can't watch over their souls. Well, I sat there and I cried. And I said, Lord, if you'll just let me live like get out of here. <laughs> I don't want to die in church, you know. But I'd rather be preaching, you know. I'd be more spiritual. Amen. We drove down to Holiday Inn downtown to eat lunch. And before we could eat, I had to turn to my kids and say, I've got to apologize. I said, God, work me over this morning. I said, I hadn't said anything to anybody. I hadn't griped to nobody except to y'all. And I said, we've got the greatest preacher in the world. And I don't want you to lose confidence in the preacher. I'm not right with God, but I got right this morning. And I want you kids to forgive me for an attitude that if I hadn't dealt with could have blown deeper and wider into such a rebellion I could have wrecked my family and wrecked my kids and wrecked my ministry it could have just started with just one little disgruntled thing and I'm still I still don't think it was exactly right but you know what my, my preacher said he said I got before God and God told me I said I'm sorry I'm sorry if God told you let's go I, and God <laughs> now, now then, God made me give a little extra. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, all God's trying to do is make us so sensitive that the least little thing that's not of God will never let slide by till we've got it right. And I, hey, by the way, folks, I'm not telling you I'm hyper spiritual. But I tell you what I do want. I want to walk with God to where if any friction ever come up between me and Sonny or between me and Jimmy, between me and Jerry, between me and anybody, I want it settled. I want it settled. I don't want to have to preach without the anointing and glory and touch of God. Amen. And I want you to pray that this week, I, listen, I told, turn to Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, pray for me, boy. God's doing a work in me. He's forcing me on with him. He's pushing me in areas I don't even want to go, but he's saying go. And I said, I'm so rebellious. I don't want to have to expand. I don't want to have to go to South Africa again. I don't want all this stuff. I can preach meetings at home and be comfortable. I've got such a rebellious heart. I want to be comfortable. And God says the way to comfort is discomfort. Till you're comforted in Jesus. Has God spoken? Has God said, I, I never will quit if I just don't quit. But God, listen, if, if nobody here heard anything, thank you for just letting me share my heart. Will you just, just thank you for listening to me while I shared my heart? Would you like to just share yours around the altar tonight? I don't know how to give an invitation anymore. Except just say, if you want to come to Jesus, if you've met God tonight, and you want to come down here and let's, let's just meet together and pray, or if you're here lost and want to be saved, why don't you just come on and get saved? God's hand was on you at one time, and now it's not. Why don't you come and get right with God? While we stand, every head bowed, every eye closed, everybody praying, just stand with you.